See, this is the reason tailgating should only be practiced with burgers and beer at the ballpark. The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. Chronicle is basically Crypto Freak the movie. You have a social outcast kid with an unstable home life who suddenly has amazing, overwhelming powers and realizes he can take whatever he wants, and he has to ultimately be taken down by another superpowered kid with a sense of responsibility. Now, certainly not every Crypto Freak in Smallville fits this formula, and some were more believable and sympathetic than others, but Andrew especially reminded me of Eric Summers from Leech, another shy outcast who gets Clark's power lets them get to his head, and decides they make him better than everyone else. First season also had a telekinetic crypto freak in Crush, Justin Gaines, but the source of Andrew's frustration is a little more realistic than his, as Justin loses his mind over injuring his drawing hand, even though he's able to completely compensate with his newfound mind powers. The one thing Andrew and Justin have in common is that both record their sick escapades through their artistic endeavors and leave them around for anyone to find. At first glance, Chronicle looks like a gimmicky cash-in on a couple of recent popular cinematic fads. Nobody's made this superhero found footage film. Well, he better knock that out before somebody else does it first. And while Max Landis and Josh Trank's influences are clear, they manage to blend a number of old ideas together to create a fresh, entertaining, and powerful character study. Yes, it's basically male carry and without the Catholicism, but with a superhero spin that allows it to go a few steps further, creating an ultimate heroic foil for our tragic protagonist. Carrie lashes out in one horrifying explosion of rage at a world she feels shunned and teased by, while Andrew's rise and fall happens a little more gradually. He allows himself to believe he's finally socially accepted and isn't remotely prepared for the shattering disillusionment of failure he's about to experience. But his soul-crushing moment of embarrassment also related to messing up formal clothes in front of a date he really likes, comes earlier than Carrie's, and he begins to articulate his god complex, justifying his separation from and superiority to the rest of humanity by calling himself the apex predator. He is, he's decided, the pinnacle of human evolution, the strongest, and therefore people are the same to him as ants are to people. Carrie has also lost her sense of empathy in a similar way, but the way Andrew comes to verbalize it makes him even more terrifying, I think, as do the opportunities he has to use his powers for good, which he ignores because he doesn't think human beings are worth saving. It explores classic superhero motifs in a totally realistic setting and situation. This easily could have been another Stephen King novel. It's another suspense thriller with a single, simple supernatural conceit, a science fiction story that asks the question, what if three high school seniors, all with a very different social status and worldview, had the power to move things around with their minds. I can imagine some viewers watching this movie and never even thinking superhero. It's a cautionary tale about disturbed, invisible kids and what happens when they're handed a proverbial loaded gun, and it uses the documentary slash found footage device to show the audience what the world looks like through their eyes, to make us experience the separation and isolation they feel that creates this detached, skewed lens they see the world through. And in contrasting Andrew with Matt and Steve, it explores two other common teen personalities, the overachiever, the complete opposite of Andrew, and the mimic, the midpoint of those extremes, who wants to be involved but doesn't have his own goals or ideas, so he tries to impress everyone to the satisfaction of no one. It watches wonderfully as just an examination of the male American high school experience, using the telekinesis conceit to highlight the dangers of each of those approaches to adolescence. But at the heart of it is a fantastic superhero origin story, and it is a real story and not another obligatory formulaic introduction to a hero, or a standard crypto freak with flimsy motivation just to create some kind of conflict for the hero. Because the final last-minute end-of-denouement resolution of the hero's character arc is to finally emerge the hero after an incredibly hard coming-of-age experience. And because it's not certain until that critical moment when Matt impales Andrew with a spear that 
we're even looking at the beginnings of a hero's journey, as we've been primarily following Andrew and seeing the world through his eyes. The most obvious superhero motif Chronicle employs is the friendship turned rivalry, out of which comes a hero and a villain who define each other. It's hard not to keep coming back to Smallville, but this is a very Clark-Lex relationship. Matt is constantly leery of and distrusting of Andrew, and that feeds into Andrew's own distrust of people at large, nudging him down his dark path. During his epic temper tantrum at the end, Andrew blames Matt for what he's doing. He hates Matt for leaving him alone, the very thing he most wants from the world now, and even screams, leave me alone, when he throws a bunch of cops and cars a la Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. And just like Dr. Manhattan, he comes to a philosophy that human life is pointless and wants to move to an isolated and peaceful place totally away from civilization. Andrew becomes what a lot of people in Watchmen are afraid Dr. Manhattan is, and he kills a bunch of people in a big city just like Dr. Manhattan is framed for doing in the movie version. I have no idea if Washman was an inspiration, and if not, those are some fascinating coincidences. As he embraces his deluded sense of godhood, Andrew becomes more and more a walking contradiction. He wants to feel superior, wants to believe himself above the insects that have proven themselves uncompassionate and cruel, yet he blames Matt for not proving himself a good friend before all this began. He doesn't really, deep down, I don't think, want to be a god, but people have disappointed him, including his own father who blames him for the death of his mother, and all he can do now is lash out and punish the world for not being what he wants it to be. Matt's main crime is just pretending to be something he's not. He's on the same journey of self-discovery his cousin Andrew is. He just hasn't experienced the same level of cruelty and disappointment from people in his life. It's hard to blame Matt for not spending more time with Andrew before the powers. Matt's right when he says Andrew's hard to talk to and he's hostile. But positive social interaction is what Andrew needs to change his dark, walled-up perceptions of people. It's very easy to understand why each feels the way he does about the other. What really puts Andrew on this nihilistic path is in the first few minutes of the film when he takes what Matt says about Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophy to heart, that because he sees people as beings of pure will, we can never fulfill our desires and therefore life is pointless and nothing matters. This is, by the way, one of the most economical and tightly plotted movies I've seen. Nearly every detail reveals something about these characters that progresses the story, and it's incredible dense, deceitfully so, given the simplicity of the overall story and its ultra-lean one-hour, 23-minute running time. So I really like how that pays off at the end. Every action has a consequence. Matt studies up on philosophy in his spare time, but he's hardly a deep thinker. He's a mock sophisticate, trying to look smart to impress people, namely the girl he's infatuated with, Casey. Matt tries too hard wanting to fit in with every crowd, even if he'd like to think he's above the social pressures of his peers. He brings up any random philosophy tidbit that vaguely relates to a situation, like when he, Steve, and Andrew drop into the faded hole that leads to the strange rocks that give them superpowers, and Matt brings up Plato's allegory of the cave, you know, just because they're in a cave. At the same time, he gives in to peer pressure and tends to follow whatever's trendy. He awkwardly sings pop songs in the radio that hardly seem to suit his personality, and he tells Andrew he has to go to a rave because he's a senior, and that's the expected thing to do. Although it's also possible, and I'm not sure which read to go with, he actually likes a lot of these high school activities and expectations, as Casey does, and he's as embarrassed about that as Andrew is about not being able to fit in at all. So he pretends like he's above it. So in trying to act too cool for school, Matt inadvertently puts the idea in Andrew's head that, like Queen said, nothing really matters. And Andrew throws that back at him at the end, blaming Matt for what he's become. Of course, Andrew is indirectly responsible for the path Matt takes as well. Matt begins to come into his own due to the sense of responsibility he develops the more he butts heads with Andrew. It's interesting how these roles start to flip the more confident Andrew becomes with his powers. Andrew starts off timid and ultra-cautious, constantly resisting Steve even Matt as they insist on dragging him to the mysterious crystals, and he begins taking more risks and becoming less responsible as he builds his telekinesis. While Matt, 
though not the thrill seeker the foolishly fearless Steve is, will throw caution to the wind if it leads to any hint of social acceptance until Andrew starts hurting people and he quickly falls into a leadership role, making rules for them to follow and insisting on calling the police to help the tailgater Andrew runs off the road. Importantly, Andrew doesn't go from responsible to reckless. His initial caution comes from a place of distrust, as does his eventual carelessness. Andrew's character arc is ignoring opportunities to change for the better, while Matt always takes them. Another major superhero story motif is the son who becomes the father. We see this in heroes and villains. In this case, it's the villain who hates his father but unwittingly becomes a destructive force because he makes all the same mistakes and turns out even worse than his father, like Smallville's Lex Luthor or Harry Osborn. Gee, I wonder if Mark Webb saw Chronicle before DeHaan was cast in that role. I like that Richard isn't another generic abusive father who only hits his kid because the film needs a tragic backstory for its tragic protagonist. I was afraid that's what we had until about midway through the film, when Steve asks Andrew about his dad. I love the disappointment in DeHaan's voice as he explains that his dad used to be a firefighter, but now he's on disability, does nothing when he's at home, goes God knows where during the day, and drinks a lot. Andrew's extreme personality and total decline is believable because he doesn't simply have a bad home life, he has a father he used to look up to who has completely let him down. Richard used to be a hero. He risked his life to save people, and now Andrew has no faith in people and no role model to replace him with. So of course Andrew cuts himself off from people and develops a dangerously unhealthy detachment that leads him to run a man off the road because he gets too close. He's more concerned with what will happen to him rather than the man and only helps people with his powers. They make him feel superior, and he won't take any real risks for other people. His father has set the example, and I think the reason he's become so abusive is because Andrew reminds him of everything he hates about himself. When he looks through Andrew's camera, he says he sees Andrew being a loser, which is exactly what he's turned into. He also calls Andrew selfish for buying a $500 video camera. I have no idea where he got that money in the first place, when his mother is dying and they can't afford her medicine, which happens to be close to that amount, $750. But Richard isn't any better. He's wasting his money on alcohol, and both vices, the alcohol and the camera, cut both men off from the world and allow them to bury themselves in their own singular universes. It's interesting that the one thing Andrew doesn't really have in common with his dad, alcohol, is something he tries and can't stomach, and that leads to his being rejected by a girl at his most vulnerable, just when he thinks he's finally being accepted. We never learn where Richard goes during the day, but it's likely another form of escape, just as Andrew's adventures with his friends exploring their telekinesis is. The one person that helps each of them retain any semblance of his humanity is Andrew's dying mother, whose declining health should bring them closer together, but doesn't because Richard wallows in self-pity and finds temporary strength in making his son feel weak. The person he imagines he's punishing is really himself. And this is exactly what the bullies at school and at the party are doing to Andrew, creating a false perception that all people are only out for themselves, so why shouldn't he be too? The ultimate physical manifestation of the psychological whammy Richard has put on his son is the closest thing Andrew has to a supervillain costume, and it's sad, perverse, and chilling. After accidentally murdering his best friend, Steve, and it's no accident that happens right after Andrew finally strong arms and throws his father, Andrew becomes the closest thing in his own mind he can to a hero, because the only person he cares about now is his mother, and he's trying to look at everyone else like the spider he kills, just because he can. So he becomes a perversion of the hero his father once was, wearing his old firefighter uniform as he murders people for the money he needs to buy his mother's medication. Again, I can't help but think of Peter Parker, who often had to deal with ordinary life issues like getting medication for his ailing aunt. This is what that might have been like without the strong father figure in the power responsibility lesson. The most tragic part is that despite the psychotic way he went about it, Andrew did more to help his mother than Richard ever did. And Richard, still hating Andrew for how much like himself he's turning out, calls him selfish again as he lies in a hospital bed, blaming him for his mother's death, which Richard, for whatever reason, thinks he could have prevented if he hadn't been out looking for Andrew. Now, this is one of those moments where Andrew has an opportunity, potentially, to turn things around, and he doesn't take it. He could tell Richard what he was doing. 
Tell him everything. And yeah, he's a murderer, and he's past the point of ever living a normal life if anyone can prove what he can do, and that he was the one who blew up the gas station, etc. But maybe if he did that, his dad would finally understand what he's done to his son, now that Andrew is all he has left. But of course, Andrew tries to kill his father, and hates Matt for saving him. He was a copy of his father, then a perversion, and now he surpassed his father's evils and become a monster. I appreciate Matt's love for his cousin at the end, even after he feels it necessary to kill him, but I have a hard time agreeing with him when he says Andrew isn't a bad person. Sympathetic, sure. I think the way he comes to his madness is understandable. It's Magneto-level believable. But yeah, he passed a threshold where I think he becomes a bad person. He might have later been redeemed or rehabilitated, but he's making a conscious choice at the end after he does some unspeakable things to just keep on doing them. And that makes him scarier than if he had just had a chemical imbalance or was generically insane. Some of my few issues with narrative logic deal with that last act and Andrew's scenes with his father, so I'll tackle those here. I find it incredibly convenient that Richard looks through Andrew's video files and says nothing about Andrew having telekinesis. I realize there are hours and hours of footage we never see, but whenever Andrew's at home or isolated with his friends, he floats his camera and he's recorded tons of impossible things. This is also the camera after he gets the telekinesis, so a lot more of the footage should have telekinesis than the one that was buried underground. And luckily, his dad didn't find any footage of him flying through clouds. I suppose it's possible he could look at some of that and see nothing supernatural, but when Andrew asks what he saw, Richard says, just you being a loser, and tells him, those people aren't your friends. Aren't they usually using their powers when they're together? And maybe he'd dismiss it as special effects, but it just seems easy that it never comes up. And this is a place where there's a camera in a situation where it's hard to swallow it would be just so a critical scene can be captured on an in-story camera. The only thing I can figure is Andrew turned it on with his telekinesis without Richard realizing it, but I'm not sure. I also think it's odd that Andrew seems to try to help his mother the most time-consuming and conspicuous way possible just to create some spectacle and showcase how far gone Andrew is before the big showdown at the end. And uh, all that's really effective, especially the way he unceremoniously drags the body of the bullies, probably gangbangers, to get their wallets blood-staining the asphalt behind them. But why not just take the medicine right from the source? Maybe Andrew would need a pharmacist to measure the amounts correctly and he can't just float out whatever he needs, but I think he'd be desperate enough to try something before resorting to petty theft. It is important that he feels powerless to save his mother as he's trying to convince himself he's the natural top of the food chain, which is totally ridiculous of course since what happened to him wasn't natural in the first place, but I didn't buy his first move would be to steal money. I could make a number of parallels between these three friends and other superheroes. When I first saw this, I was immediately reminded of the Powerpuff Girls movie. We've got three irresponsible kids with powers goofing off and wreaking havoc, and when things go too far, they stop using their powers in public. And the scenes where they're pranking people are genuinely funny. I especially like the teddy bear, which I laughed out loud at and then was horrified by because it's clearly foreshadowing Andrew's rampage. And each of these guys are kind of analogous to the Powerpuff Girls archetypes. Matt is Blossom, the responsible leader who comes up with rules and etiquette and gets up tight whenever Buttercup gets too extreme. Andrew, of course, is Buttercup, the edgy loner. And if any of them ever went dark, it would be Buttercup. She's dated a gangster and made a deal with the devil. And Steve is sort of Bubbles, totally optimistic and happy-go-lucky, though that's where this kind of breaks down. Steve's maybe a little quick to dive into trouble than Bubbles, and Blossom's more the politician type. Uh, but I digress. I haven't talked much about Steve yet. Uh, no, not that Steve. He's a little like Tony Stark, overconfident and totally in love with himself. He has delusions of grandeur, and he's maybe a bit of a womanizer. He seems to overcompensate for his own insecurities, rushing into danger to distract himself from his real fears. Chief among them, loneliness. He can't imagine why someone like Andrew would be by himself at a party. Curiously, we never learn anything about Steve or Matt's home life, and both have secrets we never know about, like what exactly Matt does when he skips class, or just how heavy into drugs Steve is, but I imagine Steve might be using his charm and outgoingness as a defense mechanism to cope with difficulties at home. 
This movie does an excellent job of subtly creating dimension for characters out of what we don't know. Even though there's a lot about Steve I'm never shown, he's not the can-do-no-wrong leader. When he flies to Andrew to, ironically, find out why he's throwing himself into danger unnecessarily, he insists that he cares about Andrew, and that he has no one else to talk to. One of the most popular kids in school only opens up to the least popular which suggests they have more in common than we realize and just have opposite but equally problematic ways of dealing with it. Steve has something to do with Andrew's downfall too, though not nearly as much as Matt does. He pushes Andrew into the limelight too fast, not realizing how fragile his ego is and how close to a breaking point he's already at. His intentions are good. He recognizes Andrew's potential, both as a showman and as a social animal, and the movie sells both well to the audience, so we're rooting for Steve and Andrew to succeed, even if the writing is on the wall. Andrew has a number of legitimately clever or funny one-liners and comebacks, like when Matt crashes and burns with Casey using a Jung quote to look too good for parties, and Andrew says, What did Jung say about glow sticks? If Andrew just stopped worrying about validation and trusted people a little, he could get along just fine. And I really like that Andrew has a natural talent for finesse with his telekinesis, because A, he's not special just because he has powers, B, he actually earns his success, even if he's lying about what exactly he's doing, and C, he's made more tragic because he's given the keys to unlock a skill that finally proves he's not worthless and then completely throws it away. The difference between Andrew and Steve is ultimately the same as with Matt. Although Steve isn't going into politics or using his powers out of a sense of altruism, he does have a sense of empathy. And the pathos here is most of it is concentrated on Andrew. Their friendship started from a selfish place on Steve's part. He only wanted Andrew for his camera, but it became something genuine. I like Andrew's speech at Steve's grave. He didn't mean to kill him, and he seems to be realizing how little control he has over his emotions. We see that last shred of humanity, which he ignores once he goes on a rampage for his mother. I also like that Steve starts as a potential symbol of hope for Andrew. After all, he saves Steve's life after that thrilling moment when the plane knocks them out of the sky, only to strike him with lightning again in the sky later on. That should have started him on a hero's path, but he let his father's influence and his discouragement get in the way. And I know a lot of viewers don't care for the choice to present this as a found footage film. It comes off as novel and forced to some people. It's the most problematic aspect of the movie, to be sure, and I don't think it was the only way to go necessarily. But I'm impressed that it really does serve a purpose, as Andrew says early on. And it's hilarious to me that Landis and or Trank might have anticipated that criticism and felt the need to tell us through Andrew's dialogue to pay attention to how the camera and POV were utilized in the story, to assure us that it's not a point pointless gimmick. The fact that Andrew is filming everything and some of the ways in which he positions and moves the camera give us insight into his view of the world. The most pivotal exchange about it is when Steve asks him if he thinks it puts a barrier between him and the world, an idea that makes Steve uncomfortable because the wall he puts up is his public face. And Andrew says, maybe I want a barrier. Again, he doesn't trust people, and he's starting to see himself, or at least is trying to see himself, as above them. So he studies people like subjects in the wild. Some of them dangerous predators. He's attacked by some of them, like a nature biographer getting too close to big cats. But he risks it because that's still easier than living among them and being them. When he does start spending time with human beings, they happen to have the same powers he does. Even though he's better at telekinesis than they are, he can look at himself as a member of an elite fraternity of super beings. Matt and Steve think they're helping Andrew to assimilate more into their world, but he still stands apart. Andrew sees himself as the center of his universe, and he creates a movie world for himself where he can look at the world through his own lens. The better he gets at his powers, the more overhead shots he uses. He wants to feel above the world. When he's at his most insecure and angry after dealing with his father, who represents everything he despises about humanity, he takes to the sky, above the world, and becomes Zeus, hurling lightning bolts at anyone who dares enter his domain. At first, I thought the movie was contriving reasons to use traditional camera moves. At Steve's funeral, Andrew creates a crane shot, and in the hospital room, he slowly moves the camera toward his bed when Richard isn't sure if he's awake, and creates a push-in. He uses everyone's phones when he's tearing apart the metro area to create a more traditional multi-shot action scene and to make it look more like a third-act climax in a superhero movie. And while those are likely calculated 
cinematography choices, I think the narrative gets away with it because Andrew is living in his own movie, in a world in both his head and camera where nothing beyond himself matters. I also like that as soon as he's impressed the student body at the talent show with his supposed magic act, and he starts to let his guard down at the party, Andrew stops using the camera and becomes part of the world around him. Just as Matt jokingly predicted, this is the beginning of his downfall, a line that might be a little convenient and on the nose, but demonstrates that Matt and Steve don't understand how not ready he is for that sort of rejection. Interesting that in trying to help Andrew find his place in the world, Matt seems to forget that he's encouraging Andrew to break one of his rules. No powers in public. And just after that, all hell breaks loose. It's also interesting to contrast Andrew with Casey, who sort of serves as Matt's Gwen Stacy. She's the girl who helps ground Matt and helps him find his identity, and who doesn't tolerate his grandstanding and acting superior. She helps lead Matt away from something closer to Andrew's way of thinking, and she's also someone constantly filming. It's a neat irony. She's more driven, well-adjusted, and self-assured than all three of them, and she is also constantly behind a camera. If she'd gotten telekinesis, she'd probably put on a costume and start saving people right away. Casey shoots with a purpose, as part of the world, to show people things they couldn't experience on a public blog. She's an activist, and was helping people long before Matt got superpowers. He had to impale his best friend with a spear before he even thought to actively use his powers for good. So the camera motif is more than a novelty, but it doesn't always seem believable. There are several moments where someone asks Andrew or Casey not to film them because people would naturally not want to constantly be filmed, but they'll keep rolling because otherwise we wouldn't have a scene. It's also not so much of a found footage movie as an imagined edit of a bunch of footage that was shot, but a lot of which couldn't be seen. And from a narrative perspective, uh, perspective, that's awkward. I suppose you could make the case that sometime after these events, somebody dug up the hole where our trio got their powers and retrieved that camera, and then a bunch of people got together and pieced the movie together with surveillance footage and miraculously intact cell phones after they dropped dozens of feet from the air. But until a sequel explains it, it sure looks like it's in-world footage edited together by real people beyond the fourth wall. There's really no reason the movie couldn't have been anchored around traditionally filmed scenes and jumped in and out of first-person POV from the cameras. Thematically, it's the same movie, and a little less distracting narratively, though it would be less visually impressive and visceral of an experience. The most physically impactful scenes leave an impression on me because the documentary approach makes me feel like I'm really there. This is not a movie I need a sequel to. It's enough to know Matt becomes a hero because of his experiences. I'm not dying to see his story because he's only interesting in relation to how Andrew affects him. And while there may be a fascinating lore behind the crystals that give him their powers... That serves this story perfectly as an unexplained, mysterious conceit. I like the rules the trio managed to piece together, that the telekinesis works like a muscle, and the hint at a government cover-up is fun. And why I really don't get why the other two get nosebleeds when Andrew loses it, except so they'll know where he is via mental link to conveniently move the plot along, I don't need to see an origin to the origin of how Matt becomes a hero. It's a shame what happened to Josh Trank's career since Chronicle. Fantastic Four was a baffling disaster, and a movie I really looked forward to after the carefully pieced together ambitious delight I found in this. Incredible that it was made for only $12 million, and I sincerely hope Trank makes more of these small, independent movies after his bad experience with a big studio, because I'd hate to think Chronicle was a fluke, or that it's the only great movie he has in him. I'm giving Chronicle a 3.5 out of 4.